So welcome everyone um, to Safe Conversations, Shifting from Domination to Partnership in Relationship, a webinar that we are delighted to bring to you um, in partnership between the Center for Partnership Studies and uh, Relationships First. And then we'll be telling you a little bit more about both organizations in just a moment. I'm Sarah Salti. I'm the Director of Leadership and Learning Programs at the Center for Partnership Studies. And um, we're so excited to bring you today this important conversation, really, that's at the intersection of two essential questions. How can we forge uh, more caring and connected interpersonal relationships? And how does the development of those relational skills help us shift toward a partnership society, the kind of society in which our institutions, policies, beliefs, and values all align to foster caring connections with one another and with our planet. Um, before I introduce our panelists today, um, I want to share with you uh, uh, a thank you to um, to all of the wonderful co-sponsoring organizations who helped us uh, get the word out about this uh, webinar. There are so too many to really name individually, but um, if you are here today because you heard about this event from one of these organizations that you see on the screen here, please thank them when you get a chance. And if you're curious to know more about the work of this world-changing group of individuals and organizations, um, you'll find links to each of them in the, um, in the follow-up materials that you'll receive after this event. Um, so thank you very much to all of you who, who helped us um, spread the word about this wonderful event today. Um, we are, I also have a quick announcement for you. Um, we're delighted to announce that today's webinar will be followed early next year by a part two, uh, a second webinar in which you'll have the opportunity to practice with the safe conversations process that you'll be learning about today. So mark your calendars for January 16th uh, and at the same time of day uh, and start planning to come with, uh, with a partner, a colleague, a friend, an, uh, someone in your, um, in your family um, with whom you'd like to, to practice your own uh, safe conversation skills. Um, and we'll learn more about that um, at later before we part ways today. We'll, we'll announce that again and, and offer you some more information. Um, I'm honored to introduce our panelists today who will be starting us off with some presentations of their key ideas and then have some, they'll be um, then having some dialogue between themselves um, before opening questions up to all of you. Um, Arvel Hendricks uh, and Heli, Helen <laughs> LaKelly Hunt are with us today. Um, they are partners in life and work. They believe that how we interact with each other in all contexts, from family to workplace to schools, is the key to our emotional, physical, and economic well-being. Together, they're committed to the transformation of relationships and to the evolution of a relational culture. They're the co-creators of Imago Relationship Theory and Therapy, which has spread globally through Imago Relationships International and is now renamed Imago Relationships Worldwide, an organization that has trained over 2,500 therapists in over 53 countries. They are also co-creators with other relational therapists, scientists, and business professionals of Relationship First, Relationships First, a nonprofit organization that contributes to the creation of relational culture through the distribution of new insights from the relational sciences and through Safe Conversations, which is a structured three-step process to talk and listen with real connection. Uh, so welcome, Helen and Harville, who are joining us from New York City today. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. I also want to introduce um, Rian Eisler. 
Um, Rian Eisler is internationally known as a system scientist. She is an attorney working for the human rights of women and children and the author of groundbreaking books such as The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future, which is now in 26 foreign editions, and The Real Wealth of Nations, Creating a Caring Economics, among many other books. Dr. Eisler has received many honors, including honorary PhDs and Peace and Human Rights Awards. She lectures worldwide with venues including the United Nations General Assembly, the U.S. Department of State, congressional briefings, universities, corporations, conference keynotes, and events hosted by heads of state. Rian is president of the Center for Partnership Studies, which is dedicated to the research and to research and education on social and economic transformation. She's co-founder of CPS's Caring Economy Campaign. And with Nobel Peace Laureate Be Betty Williams, she's also the founder of the Spiritual Alliance to Stop Intimate Violence, or SAVE. And she's editor-in-chief of the Interdis Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies, which is an online peer-reviewed journal housed at the University of Minnesota that was inspired by Rian's work. Welcome to you as well, Rian. Thank you, and it's wonderful to be with you. <laughs> So with no further ado, we want to begin today with a, with a presentation um, with, by Harvel and Helen. So Harvel, I will stop sharing my screen and let you begin sharing yours. All right. So I don't see anything at the bottom. Share. That one? Um, yep. Nope. Nope. Just click on that. It was supposed to Sorry, work. Sorry, why you come around again? So we're coming. Yes. <laughs> I can okay. see that. I think you just need to open the slides from which look like they're minimized on the bottom of your screen. Oh, there they and are. And I'll go ahead right and there. say, uh, Harvel and I are thrilled to be here, and we're going to talk about a process called Safe Conversations. Uh, it's exciting being married to Harville. He simplifies things that are very murky and uh, makes it easier to, um, to shift from conflict to connection. Yeah, and sometimes I hit the wrong button <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> uh, on uh, this uh, marvelous thing called technology. So we're delighted uh, to be here uh, today and to talk about something that uh, is dear to our hearts, uh, which is um, called Safe Conversations, which is a uh, three-step process, as was uh, indicated, about how to talk, and that we found this uh, process to be effective, fact the key effective thing in, in couples therapy. And about 10 years ago, we pulled it out of couples therapy and uh, decided we would introduce it to the culture. And we like to start off by saying that um, what's, uh, what has come out of the research is that human relationships are now hands down uh, from research essential for human thriving. And the question has been then, so what kind of human relationship? And the research on that is that there's only one kind that is essential for human thriving and that works, which is one whose primary feature is safety. And when the relationship is safe, then it's healthy. If it's not safe, it's not healthy. And it's that simple. So as we work with this, we've discovered that there are uh, three uh, stages of relationships. And we want to show you a video in which those three stages show up. Uh, in a, a video called The Still Face by Ed Tronick, who's a child psychiatrist at Harvard, uh, called, uh, and, and in this, there are the three stages, and we'll just let you look at it without identifying them, and then we'll tell you briefly what they are. So here, here we go with The Still Face. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago. 
when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little So we believe that this, uh, and we see this um, video and this uh, interaction between a caretaker and an infant as a template, a universal template for the stages of all relationships. And I imagine as you saw it, now you uh, discovered the three steps or the three phases. They all start out great. All relationships start out great. When you fall in love, it starts out great. When you get a new job, it starts out great. You have a new friend, it starts out great. And then it's a universal experience that most relationships shift and it shifts away from the initial euphoria to frustration. And so they become terrible. And the third thing is like the baby at the end, you spend all your life, we spend all our lives, everybody spends all their lives trying to recover that original greatness, that original good feeling. So a lot of us get stuck in phase, in stage two. And uh, when I was dating Harville, um, and he was telling me about a theory he was developing, he would say, Helen, why does the dream become a nightmare? And, uh, and people didn't know how to get out of a nightmare. So here's the good news. For the first time in the history of the world, there's a relational science that's teachable uh, due to the, um, a lot of wisdom with relationship therapists uh, working in the, in the science of it, but also the breakthroughs in neuroscience in the 1990s made um, a lot more clarity in how you can have um, two people in conflict transform their relationship into connection. Um, so basically, Harville wants this, and I agree, out of the clinic, out of the therapy offices. Yes, it's there, but it should be everywhere. It's so simple. Um, and this little uh, cartoon that Harville put on this slide, for example, you go to school to learn what's important, but they don't teach you anything about relationships. But today, for the first time, there could be four R's in school, reading, writing, arithmetic, and relationship. And you'll be much better prepared in life when you learn these simple skills. We believe everybody can become relationally competent. Yeah, and that relational competency is our goal and should be the goal, we think, of every educational institution. One thing that Safe Conversations does is we have a new definition of relationship. Typically, a relationship is a, two people with a history and they 
stumble around and they, they like each other, but then conflict happens and they don't know what to do. Uh, so the old definition of relationship, these two people with the history, um, when, when they're in conflict, you have to change the inside to have a good relationship. So may, they may go to therapy, different therapists, or, or they may uh, try to work on a spiritual practice or whatever. Um, and um, believing that if you change the inside, then you can come back and have a good relationship. And that's not all, it's not always the case. Our definition of relationship is two people and the space between them. And to have a transformed rela a relationship, you work on creating safety in the space between. When two people are safe, like that mother uh, with a, the little child that wants to play and wants to engage her mother, the, the little child felt safe because the mom was engaged and present to the child's experience. The child felt safe. But if, when the mother turned away, the... Um, the baby began to de decompensate in anxiety because the relationship wasn't, um, a, they were not attuned to each other. And uh, Safe Conversation teaches safety in the between and what is needed for the relationship to be transformed. Basically, the space between is the relationship and the quality of the space between <clears throat> um, to make the relationship safe is safety, curiosity, and empathy. The interaction in the space between results, once it's safe, in collaboration, cooperation, and co-creation. So many people ask us, well, how did y'all get into this work? And I think the answer is that we fell into it uh, in 1977 when we first met uh, and we began to talk about why were we divorced? Uh, we were both divorced then. And why do couples fight? Why does anybody fight? What's wrong with the human race? And uh, so we had these really big questions, but we turned why do couples fight into a research question? And we did research on that for about eight years and produced a book called uh, Getting the Love You Want, a guide for couples. And in that was our first uh, response to this question. Since the book, um, we have uh, reduced the complexity of why couples fight to a one answer. And that is couples fight because they do not like the point of view of their partner. It's called objection to difference. If I see the world as green, I expect that you see the world as green, don't you? Mm -hmm. I see and when so. you see the world as purple, it's like, well, something's wrong with your eyes. So difference has always been a problem for um, couples. But what we've discovered since then is that difference is a problem for everybody, that it is the human problem is the objection to difference. And we think that's what produces a top down and what produces dominance uh, and control. It's what produces violence, conflict and war. What we discovered is that everybody objects to difference. So it's my way, not my way or the highway. There's no other way. This is the right way. You don't understand. It's uh, going to be the way I see it. So we think this is, we call this symbiosis. We think this is actually a, a, a quality of the mind, which is uh, sort of at the level of the human problem that we have to change. So what we uh, have uh, come to is that we need to develop in order to change that relational competence. And relational competence has something to do with um, how we see um, other people. Because without relational competence, our experience is that talking is the most dangerous thing people do. And everybody talks. So the danger is potential in every conversation that somebody will say something and the other person will say, well, that's not right. And then you'll say, well, I know it's right. Oh, uh, it's always been right. And this is the truth. This creates a distinction in um, 
philosophies and politics and religion and, and, and even in science, we're discovering in the wonderful field of quantum physics, the quantum physicists don't quite agree on what the universe is like. So we've decided to take this job on by delivering safe conversations as a technology through our not-for-profit uh, relationships first to the whole world. And what it basically uh, is, the intention it basically has is to teach relational competency made up of three steps. To help people talk without polarizing. To listen without judgment. And we, we discovered that listening is a very powerful and underused human capacity. And that you know when you are listening, when you are changed by what you hear. Uh, Helen mentioned earlier about uh, the, 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 um, the something about uh, master talk that when you don't get that, or maybe that's coming up, but listening without judgment, connecting beyond difference. So relational competency, when you can do three things, talk without polarizing, listen without judgment, and connect beyond difference. Again, what I said I admire so much about Harville is how he simplifies something very complex. Uh, and he points out there are only three things you have to do to transform any relationship into from conflict to connection. And it really does work. We can solve any relationship problem uh, with three skills. The first skill is um, a new way to talk, which uh, we call dialogue. A couple slow down and they take turns uh, speaking and listening. I used to be great at talking at the same time as Harville. It, but didn't make him very happy when I did. <laughs> um, now, uh, now he he waits while I'm talking, and and this and the same with me. The the one idea to learn is that how you were raised, uh, the past really influences the present, and two people need to learn a little bit about each other's past, and knowing about their past helps you be empathic, and you you then understand why someone is acting the way they are or why someone has the thoughts they have instead of just judging it as wrong. Um, the third thing is learning to care for what we're really emphasizing in our time with you, Rian, is the space between. And um, you have to learn to take care um, that mother and baby uh, mm -hmm. When she looked at the baby with a certain look in her eye, the baby could relax. Uh, when, she, when she had a still face and her eyes were not animated and she didn't point, the, the baby got very anxious, right? So to care for the space between just remove negativity from our relationships and every day express some affirmations. And the person you're with will relax. They'll, they'll be much more relaxed with you and they'll be open to your difference and handle um, problems that may emerge better when they're relaxed in your presence. So the old way of talking that we're gonna suggest needs to be tossed is a monologue Boy, people get really, really good at that. I bet you know some people that are great with monologue. They're proud of their master talk. I mean, they, they, wanna, they wanna talk that way. They don't know there's a better way and they don't really realize the impact of, on others. But when you're master talking, it means you know the truth and others don't. So basically monologue is hearing but not listening, which results in rejection and deflection, and it produces disconnect in the space between. Can't connect with monologue. So, so we have a new way to talk. Do you want to do this? And the new way, yeah, it's okay. You mm -hmm. want to do it. So the new way is what we're talking about today is safe conversations, which changes the vertical way of talking and monologue and also the verticality in most human institutions in Western civilization and turns them flat, makes them lateral, and therefore creates equalities because you're now speaking with rather than to someone. 
That may seem like a small thing, but it's actually an axis change that would change uh, the relationship and ultimately the world. One person is talking, the other person is listening. Now, when we take turns talking, that's when you experience safety. When we experience safety, we do something that's essential to come to terms with difference, which is we can differentiate. Differentiate means that I get it, you're not me. And you have another point of view and your point of view is as valid as my point of view is valid. And we accept each other's view of the world as the only thing we can have, because I cannot have your view of the world, you cannot have my view of the world. Even if we agreed on the views of the world, there would still be difference. Because the brains cannot copy each other like a printer can copy or a copier can copy. Brain is always creative, making up its own version of reality. And when we know that, then we can tolerate difference because we know difference is the only reality there is. And when we differentiate, what that means is we can connect beyond the difference. That moves us then from conflict to connecting. Differentiate, symbiosis is the human problem. Differentiation is a human solution. And connecting is a result of the transformation from that. So in summary, the structure of safe conversation and the process creates safety in the space between. And safety is non-negotiable for all humo ecosystems to thrive. And Rian, we're so thrilled to be with you on this webinar. All right, so we'll shift now back. Thank you so much, um, Helen and Harville, and um, uh, for for getting us getting us rolling and starting to think about um, this this um, way of thinking about the space in between. And um, I want to bring in now uh, Rian. Um, and Rian, let me just take a moment and get our uh, get your slides um, queued up for us here. And um, and then we will, um, nope, that's not where we want to be. <laughs> we'll try that one more time. Ah. There we are. So welcome, Rian. Um, be sure to unmute yourself uh, and then um, we'll let you share if you <laughs> uh, share your own welcome. And that is true. I had muted myself. Well, first of all, thank you, Helen, and thank you, Harville, and welcome to everyone. Um, I had a little accident, but I couldn't miss this. So I'm here with you today. And I'm so glad I am, because what Helen and Harville describe, and I'm going to take a different perspective, is not something that's embedded in our brain. Uh, it is really what we have learned to fit into what my research shows are domination systems. Because uh, I'm going to go to my new book, and, and we're going to vary this a little bit, uh, because I want to respond also to what was said and place it in a different context. Um, my new book, which is Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, just came out with Oxford University Press. And one of its uh, main themes is precisely that the issue is not really our genes. Uh, in fact, studies that are cited in this book, uh, men who have a gene that predisposes them to violence, not all of the men with that gene are violent. Uh, only those that had what we call adverse childhood experiences. So starting with the baby is very much in point because uh, the beauty of that video though, is that it shows that we are shifting, at least in some world regions, more to the partnership side because that mother really wanted to engage with that baby by making that baby feel safe and connected, connected. Uh, so 
well, I think Harville had an, and, and, and Helen have a wonderful technology, which is why I wanted to do this webinar to help us in this time of transition for many of us, because we wouldn't even want to use this technology if we were still, for example, in the European Middle Ages, which looked a lot like the Taliban, if you really think about it. Uh, you know, the Inquisition, the Crusades, the witch burnings, women had no rights, children had no rights, and even thinking something that was outside of the accepted order was a, a death sentence practically with torture. Uh, in fact, St. Augustine put it very well. He said of that time that for anyone to think of changing their station in life was like a nose wanting to be an eye. The rankings, the top-down rankings, were so rigid. Now, we've moved from that. And the fact that neuroscience is now looking at these things, and by the way, Nurturing Our Humanity combines my research, the research of my co-author, uh, with what we are learning from neuroscience. The issue is the interaction of our growing brains, because we're not born with fully developed brains, with our environment and the degree to which our environments as mediated by families in particular, by education, by religion, by politics, economics, uh, orients to the domination or partnership side of the social scale are categories that go beyond right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, uh, really has a profound impact on how we learn to relate. It's that simple. Uh, if we're, we're born into a culture and subculture where the family is a nomination family, we learn exactly the kinds of communications that Helen and Harville describe uh, but they're not built into our minds. If they were, we couldn't change, right? And their technology is a wonderful way of changing. So I want to contextualize all of this. And as I said, the nature of our relations is heavily influenced by social, economic, and historical factors. But, and this is part of the good news, it isn't a one-way street. We have choices about how we relate to others both inside and outside our families. We can change relationships so we are more caring and empathic. And empathy, uh, and please can I have the next slide, empathy is uh, one of the keys, of course, of creating that safe space where people can actually listen to each other rather than just wanting to control, to impose their own will. But as important as it is to work on our individual relations and to see, as Helen and Harville point out, better relations are possible. We also have to shift from domination to partnership in our social beliefs, values, and structures. And if we don't, it's like trying to go up on a down elevator, really. <laughs> you know, we may create this little enclave for ourselves, but the band marches on, and it's the domination band. Next slide, please. Now, the first way that we really can understand this, and I know I'm asking many of you to get out of your comfort zones, is to change our thinking. You know, Einstein said it, we can't solve problems with the same thinking that created them. And my research and now the research of others has identified two social categories that go beyond right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern. Uh, you know, we've had repressive, oppressive, violent societies in all these categories. You know, whether it was Nazi Germany, uh, I happen to have been born in, in Austria, I was a Holocaust uh, child survivor. Uh, or whether they're Eastern, like the ISIS. I mean, these are extreme examples. They can be secular, they can be religious, they can be Eastern, they can be Western. But the real issue is 
a configuration. And it's very interesting because you cannot see this configuration unless you factor in the part of the picture that is left out of conventional social studies. And what am I talking about? These studies are very often aptly called the study of man. And we're told, don't worry about it, man includes woman. Actually, the word woman includes man. But the point is that if you leave out the majority of humanity from your sociological approach, you don't see connections. And you don't see the connection between what happens to the majority of humanity, women and children, who until recently, even in the West, were pretty much you know, controlled in families with only the male half of humanity making decisions in the uh, so-called public sphere of politics and economics. And it isn't that men are bad, it's gender socialization, and I'll get to that. But in domination systems, what you have are rigid hierarchies of control. In partnership systems, you do have hierarchies. We need parents, we need teachers, we need uh, managers, we need leaders, but they are, and, and part of the sign of shift to, to the partnership side is that in the management literature, we're now talking, uh, we, we read about empowering leadership rather than disempowering leadership of the good manager as someone who facilitates and helps others realize their potentials actualize. So we're shifting from power over to power with. Of course, there's a lot of resistance and there are regressions. And I'll get to that in a moment. And but but they characterize these relations are superior inferior relations. So why should I listen to you? I am uh, your superior and only the person who is the, the role which is very much relegated to women in domination systems uh, is, you know, the inferior role. So what do women do? They don't listen. They manipulate. Uh, they uh, really, because they can't ex exert, uh, you know, they can't really express themselves, right? So uh, this, this is something we're shifting from to relations of mutual respect. And it's not a question of dominate or be dominated, but of really mutuality. And yes, in domination systems, and this is a core component of them, you rank men over women and you rank so-called masculinity over so-called femininity. Whereas in gender partnerships, you value caring, caregiving, and nonviolence, which are supposed to be feminine, right? In women, men, and in social and fiscal policy. And I really want to go to the next slide because that is so important. So the nomination configuration, you start in the family, because which is left out of sociology. I mean, which is insane. And my research, and as I said, all my books, but especially now this new book that combines neuroscience with my findings of these configurations, uh, really starts with family. Why? Because we know that our developing brains are not fully formed, and they develop, as I said, to start with in interaction with our environments, which for humans, of course, our cultural environments. And yes, there is in domination systems a great deal of fear, abuse, and violence, all the way from child and wife beating to abuse by, quote, superiors in families, workplaces, and societies. The fact that the APA, the American Psychological Association, recently, uh, recently, I mean, they should have done it eons ago, came out with a statement that spanking is not only ineffective, but that it is harmful, is part of the trend, the movement towards partnership. Gender roles and relations are central to this, and so are narratives and language. The beliefs and stories we are told. Can I have the next slide? Because I want to go through this rather fast now. Uh, the partnership configuration, of course, has the kind of communication modeled 
that Helen and Harville described. Not perfect. You know, we're never going to be perfect. We're going to lose it. Uh, you know, we're going to lapse back, especially in this time when we're trying to shift from what so many of us have been taught. You know, domination relationships rather than partnership relationships. But it's a more democratic structure with hierarchies of actualization. And parenting is authoritative, not authoritarian. There is you don't need that much fear, abuse, and violence because you don't have to maintain these top-down rankings. And as Helen and Harville said, there is respect and acknowledgement of diversity and with this of human rights. Um, gender roles I'll get back to and, and narratives I'll get back to. <coughs> but can we have the next slide, please? So what we really need to do is to change our story. Because we've been told, uh, and we continue to be told, a false story about, quote, human nature. What we're learning from neuroscience, and we have these studies in nurturing our humanity, is that our so-called pleasure centers of the brain light up more, and these are studies, when we share than when we win. Isn't that amazing? That is so contrary to the story of these evolutionary imperatives that, oh, well, too bad, you know, uh, we are wired for rape, for war. My co-author <coughs> in Nurturing Our Humanity, the anthropologist Douglas Fry, is one of the world's authorities on foraging societies, and you know what he calls them? The original partnership societies. They were more egalitarian, more gender balanced, and they were not warlike. And this is how we lived for millennia. Got to change our story because we are wired for empathy and caring, but, but, and it's a big but, will these capacities be cultivated from childhood on or will they be inhibited or compartmentalized? as they are in domination environments. Next slide, please. So building a partnership world, really we need four cornerstones. Childhood is where it starts. Gender, and I'll get back to that. Economics and narratives and language. Next slide, please. Now, as you learn new relationship skills based on mutual respect, trust, nonviolence, and caring, not only in your family, and other intimate relations, but all your relations, you have to keep in mind, as Helen and Harville said, our past. If we were brought up in families where that was not modeled, and most of us, to, a, to some extent, not all of us, and it's changing. I mean, that's the good news. Uh, we are going <clears throat> to have that as our sort of, you know, that's, that's, that's normal, right? And it's really in our families uh, and in early childhood, you know, that we first learn to respect the rights of others or we learn, well, that human rights violations are normal. And that's where you and I everyday practice either domination or partnership relations. Next, please. Neuroscience shows that what children first experience and observe, and it's worth repeating this, because it's so foreign to what we're told about, quote, human nature. It impacts how our brains develop. 85% of our brain architecture is formed in the first five years. So a child's relationship with primary caregivers in those years has a decisive impact on the brain and yes, this relationship is very different in a domination or partnership context. But that doesn't mean we can't unlearn, okay, and relearn. And that's what this safe relationships technology helps us do. But let me talk about gender. Because, you know, you, you, we, we're so used to thinking of gender, oh, well, that's just a women's issue. Heck no. It is a human issue because it directly impacts how our brains develop. It starts from birth. And it's very different in partnership and domination systems. Next, please. 
In domination systems, boys are socialized to equate masculinity with controlling others, including dominating girls and women. Now that's what we today hear called toxic masculinity at partnership trend. I don't like the term toxic masculinity because it isn't men. They've been taught this. You know, I mean, what really happens is that boys are told that they're sissies, they're wimps, weak sisters, if they exhibit feminine traits like caring and nonviolence. You know, out of 1600 years, 1600 years of so-called Western science, gender studies, women's studies, men's studies, queer studies, only entered our universities 50 years ago. Think about that for a minute. How stuck we have been in thinking that this is not important. It is vital. Please continue with the next slide. In domination systems, well, we, I mean, I certainly did. We're supposed to please others and we're supposed to submit. And the women who don't, uh, they're ball breakers, right? They're not, quote, feminine. So they either manipulate, you know, as powerless people have to do, or they reverse roles. They become the henpecking wife or the ball breaking boss. It's not feminine. But in domination systems, both genders then are deprived of part of their humanity because as oh, men's studies is so important now, it isn't only women's studies, it's men's studies because men have the capacity to be sensitive, to be empathic, to be caring. But if you're constantly being told that if you do that, you're going to grow up and not be a real man, hey, you've got a problem. Good news, we're moving away from it. Next slide, please. Now, in partnership systems, women can be assertive without being ball breakers, and men can be caring without being unmanly. And safe conversations really, from my perspective, helps people to practice expressing their full humanity and moving from domination relationships to partnership relations. Next slide, please. Now, I really want to, as I said, contextualize this because it's as important and it's vital that we work on leaving behind, you know, what we've been taught. Uh, our, you know, this is how we should relate. You know, Mr. Trump models that. You know, he's a bully and you're going to do what I'm told or else I'm going to have a fit and I'm going to punish you and I'm going to insult you. Uh, that's not human. He comes by it very honestly from his own background, okay? He learned this, and we know this about his background. But the problem is that these domination gender roles, and we see it in this present administration, adversely impact us all because historically, social and fiscal priorities have followed a gendered system of valuation. If, as in the Northern European nations like Sweden, Finland, Norway, uh, women have a higher status and women are 50% of the national legislature, men no longer feel it's such a threat to their status, to their quote masculinity, to also vote, to also vote for more caring values. So they have universal health care, early childhood education is supported, very, very important, uh, very generous paid parental leave. I mean, we're talking about having the social context so that the relations that we're learning now to have uh, will have backup in social policies. And I want to close now, I meant I went a little further, uh, where we're running a little late here, but I, I just want to say to you, uh, work on your personal relations, but as many of you are doing already, uh, yes, work on shifting our society, work on those four cornerstones um, of, of, of childhood, gender, economics, and I 
I, I've written a great deal about what I call partnerism or a caring economics, a, a new economic system that recognizes the economic value of the work of caring for people starting in early childhood and caring for our mother earth, which is by the way, essential in our post-industrial age. But anyway, that's what I want to close with. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Rian. Um, and, and what a, a tremendous richness now we, we have, have in, in terms of all that, that we've heard from these two different um, uh, starting points and, and, and context. I want to check in with all our panelists now because um, and, and hear from you what you what, which direction you'd like to go from this point. Um, we're about at the point in our um, time together where we had scheduled to have some conversation between the two uh, between Helen and Harville and Rian. Um, but we also have more to hear from from Helen and Harville and I'm wondering which of those you'd like to do um, next and how, how you'd like to use the rest of our time. So, well, I, I think what we would, what I would like at least is, and Helen you can say, is to show a dialogue so that people can see the technology of a conversation that creates partnership rather than, and therefore obviously is adverse to domination. I, I too thought that instead of the audience, of those attending, listening to talk, maybe watch. Yeah. Is that okay, Rian? Absolutely, but I do think that we should, um, I hopefully make it short so that we can be, interact. It, it, okay. it will be very short. It'll be the, the thing and Harville will say three sentences. I say nothing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you had so much to say and I understand why we went over and it's okay. Yeah. It is, no, of course, it's perfectly fine. Just want to make sure we're all, uh, in agreement on on how we want to use the rest of our time together. So that sounds wonderful, Harvel. If you want to go ahead and share the video, and then we'll yeah. come back all together and take it from there. Yeah, the, yeah. I'd like to do that because one of the things we've learned and why we do the videos is we found what we're teaching is a skill, so yes. that people can participate in a conversation that makes <laughs> them equal. And if we can show them what that looks like, then they can get it faster than if we describe it. So we'd like to show you here is a couple, um, and I hope now we will get this right. And we'll go down here. And I want to see the slide first. Nope. How do Let I get follow Lori's? How do okay. I get to I there? think you want to just go straight to opening the video itself and making sure that those audio buttons are clicked. There we are. Okay, but there's a yes. slide preceding that okay, that I wanted to show. Why don't you do this? Okay. Let's just do that. So, so, so hold on just a second. So since the slide is not there, um, it's important to know what uh, these people are doing. Now, what we've got set up here is a couple. And what we want to say ahead of time is that they, what we're interested in teaching is the process that they're going to engage in and uh, stating its applicability to any conversation and anyone in a conversation, parents and children, teacher to students, students to each other, boss to employee, boss to boss or whatever. But there's a structure here and you're going to watch uh, this couple go through and Helen's gonna set it up and then I'll facilitate doing what we call mirroring, which is step, step one of the uh, safe conversations process. Then they will do validating which is uh, making clear that each other makes sense, that their worlds are valid, and then thirdly, empathy. So that's what you'll see this couple doing. Presumably. And we're no longer seeing your screen shared. Oh, here we go. This we're not seeing is the video running. Um, okay, so 
I, I'm sorry, we had it embedded in the slide and it got moved and now there's only uh, the faces there. I think that somebody there? said we were going to, um, anyway, so the, the video is not showing. I thought we had one video and then two other uh, title pages for different applications, uh, but it is not, it is not working. Right. Okay, uh, we think we're going to fix it. And uh, we'll mention now that there are two other videos that can be seen after the webinar. Yeah. Um, yeah so I think that's important because people really can watch it. And we just, I guess we were meant to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, someone here is trying to get it to function. So let's um, wait. Looks let's like, see. Looks like we've got it. Here we go. Uh, two yeah, but the audio isn't working now. <laughs> okay, the audio just stopped. I'm so sorry, but there's no audio. Harville, I think that you're on mute. Um, Need express. There we go. It was a chill. Now we're hearing. Yes, I do. Great. All right. So now your eyes can lock into uh, a gaze. Shift that glare into a gaze. And by taking three deep breaths at the same time. <sighs> Again, uh, Dennis, as you begin to talk, um, Mitra, if you if you get on overload, raise your hand and say, "Whoops, you know, I'm, let me mirror back what I've heard so far." Um, and uh, Harville will begin the sentence stems. So um, the uh, the sentence stem that we'd like you to start with, Dennis, uh, is to make connection again with uh, Denitra and say, when I was a child, I lived with a family in which I felt, uh, and then you uh, connected with one of those columns, neglected or intruded upon. So I lived with a neglectful or intrusive. We all know we live with both, but one was more difficult than the other. Pick that. And with that person, I experienced the wound. Okay. So. Um, Denitra, when I was a, a child, uh, I lived with a family uh, in which I uh, felt it was, uh, felt neglected. Um, and the, uh, that childhood wound uh, led me to feel uh, helpless. Uh, so if I got that. So if I got that. And hold this up. Oh. So, and hold it like a rock star, because otherwise it won't <laughs> cast out to anybody. Um, so let me make sure I got that right. When you were a child, you felt neglected, and it made you feel helpless. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> you did. So is there more? Is there, yes. <laughs> is there more about that? Um, there is. Um, my family... Um, was actually uh, broken up uh, because um, my dad had to be the breadwinner uh, growing up. And, uh, my mother had passed away. And uh, so um, me and my siblings ended up having to live in different uh, locations. And so that kind of put me up this, this led to. And so um, that's why I kind of feel that way. So let me make sure I understand. Um, when your mother passed and your dad had to be the breadwinner, you were placed in different places, you and your sisters. And, um, and it made you turn inside of yourself because you just felt like no one was there. Am I a lot getting of times. this? Am I getting this? Yes, you are. Is there more about that? Um, yes, there is. 
Um, and so um, feeling that way um, kind of leads to the how I am now today. I uh, do whatever I can with, with our kids to uh, make sure that they'll never feel that way. And so I'm very possessive, possessive and protective uh, of my family. I never want anything like that to happen to our family. Let me make sure I understand you. Um, because you felt that way as a child, helpless, um, neglected, you do everything you can to make sure that our kids don't feel that way. So you protect them and you're possessive over them. You don't want them to feel that. Did I get that right? That's correct. Yes, you got it. Is there more about that? And so the more here is, so the need that was not met in childhood that I brought to our relationship is. So the, uh, the need that I need most uh, filled uh, in my life that I didn't get when I was a child um, is that I need to feel uh, a sense of security um, and, and to uh, try to stay away from being helpless. Oh, just want to be sure I understand you, you have a need to feel secure um, and not helpless. Mike, did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> is there more about that? Uh, no, I don't believe so. That's, that's it. So let me see if I've got all of that. Summarize. So uh, just to summarize, um, the type of parenting that you received made you feel... Which help. was? Oh. The type of parenting you received, which was? Which was... Uh, neglectful. Kind of neglectful. Um, made you feel helpless. You received that wound. Okay. And the need that you didn't get mad, that you brought to our relationship was um, a need to feel secure, a need to protect from those feelings. Um, did I get that right? You did. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. And so uh, what, that makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. That makes, okay. right. So what makes sense is given your childhood, Okay. Uh, in which you felt neglected and mm -hmm. helpless. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that the need you brought to our relationship is. Okay. So given the neglect that you felt in your childhood and the wound that you felt, it makes sense that you have this need. Um, <clears throat> and what was the last That you brought to a, your adult you, life. That you brought to your adult life. It makes sense to me. Of feeling secure. Okay. The need of feeling secure. Um, and then check. Is that a good validation that Is, I get you? Did I get that right? Is that a good validation? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yes, I was, I was really glad about that. <laughs> that feels, really, feels really good. <laughs> and well, uh, then I can imagine, given okay. all that, the wound and the need, okay. uh, that when uh, in adulthood, you get that need met by me mm -hmm. that you feel. Okay. I can imagine with you having that wound, given that wound, you might feel helpless or have a need to feel secure. Um, and in adulthood, if you get that need met, you would feel. Okay. And in adulthood, if you get that need met, that you would feel secure. Um, um, basically, yes. Just secure and you'd feel... Uh, validated as a person. Is that the feeling? Is that the feeling? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so check, is there another feeling or other feelings that he might also be having okay. about all that? So are there other feelings that you might be having about that? Well, <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> everything you said is true. Uh, one thing I do need to to let you know is that uh, during that time frame, during that period, um, it's not that my, my father was necessarily neglectful. He was just in a situation to where yeah. he couldn't be there. So. so what you also want to express is, and her feeling. Okay. So what you also want to express is that you understand that your dad 
was not intentionally harming you, but he had to do what he had to do, but it still made you feel, oh, but it still made you feel neglected. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> so, well, thank you for sharing all of that with me. Okay. So thank you for sharing all of that with me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. And now you get a one minute full body hug with deep breathing. Fabulous. <laughs> Uh, Helen and Harville, you need you are on mute, so we want to be sure to hear your your words. And it looks to me like you're muted through the Zoom mute and not now. There we go. All right. All right. Now we got double. Okay. And I want to say I'm glad you showed that because there's another computer competing for dominance. Yes. <laughs> it was very good to so, see. Can you hear us now? Want to be heard. I can't hear Rian. Can you hear me? I do hear you, Rian. It sounds like Helen oh. and Harville maybe cannot. There we go. There we go. You're I back on? Okay. I wanted to say it's so important, isn't it, that there be mutual respect. And this is what this modeled. And also that uh, a person is feels safe. And I want to say that nobody really feels safe in domination environments because the person who is the do who dominates is always worried that they're going to lose that. And for them, there are only two alternatives. You either dominate or you're dominated. They can't see the partnership alternative. And right. that's really what's so important is yes. that there is a partnership alternative. Absolutely. And this particular structure helps them live that partnership, live that equality, because in a, a situation like this, we always reverse this. Then she talks and he listens. And so what, ha what happens is it creates safety because the brain needs to know what's coming next. And if it knows what's coming next, then it can be open. If it doesn't know what's coming next, then it will be defensive. And it's sort of like in meditation, they learned that what makes meditation work is that the brain knows that the next thing coming is a breath. And therefore, that's what relaxes you, not the mantra that you focus on, but the brain knowing you're going to breathe in, then you're going to breathe out. So in the dialogue process, you know, when you talk, you're going to be mirrored. And then you're going to be asked, did I get it? Did I get it? And then you're going to say, is there more about that? And you're going to have a summary and a validation and an empathy. So you create safety in the interactions themselves. And so what we like to do is to teach this uh, and then tell couples what they just learned um, because then, because they usually have a rather magical experience. Well, can we open it perhaps now? Let's skip the part where we talk to each other and let's open it up uh, to so that the people who are here, if that's okay with everyone, sure. can, can, can talk with us, unless there is some burning thing that you feel that we need to discuss between us. Mm. Maybe it should take just a couple of minutes. You know, well, what, I, what I'd suggest is that we, um, offer an invitation now for people to begin formulating questions that you'd like to bring forward. And as you think of them to begin sharing them in the chat box. And while you're taking a moment to think about what questions you'd like to bring forward, um, Helen and Harville, please go ahead and, and respond. So, so do you have a comment? Yeah, you let, make? I'll just make a quick comment. The gentleman we just saw in the video, no, he was neglected. And to me, it was so beautiful, just her looking him in the eye and repeating back his words and saying, is there more? Wow, did his face light up? It just made me wonder, you know, how many times has someone tried to get every word he said and even say, is there more? That's the phrase that people love hearing yes. instead of, we say, uh, most people they might mirror you back, but they'll go, are you done yet? Because I'm ready to talk. I have something to say about what you're saying. So would you hurry up? Because I have something, to, I have a response. But when someone says, is there more? 
the people just go, you're really interested? You're really listening? Yeah, so it deepens the listening, <clears throat> right? Deepens the listening so that you actually are impacted by what you hear. If you're not impacted, you can't change. So, so if you listen deeply, and that's what the mirroring For those does. of you who might want to uh, do it tonight at home, uh, and you might want to give someone an appreciation uh, or anyone at home, give everyone at home a, a separate appreciation. They might be so surprised when you do. So, so there's one overview, 90,000 foot thing I wanted to say about uh, Rion's comment that sociology left the family out. And Helen and I have been looking at relationship science. And, and we know that the relationship, relationship as a science didn't begin until 2000, around 2000, which means that relationship as a discipline, like psychology is a discipline or anthropology is a discipline or sociology is a discipline, but relationship, which is the interaction of people with each other, does not even have a discipline. <clears throat> that it's all been attached to other disciplines like re relational psychology or relational sociology. So what we've been aware of is in the educational system of Western civilization, the relationship is not in the curriculum. And then we wonder how come people have such bad relationships? Well, what's in the curriculum is how to be an autonomous independent individual, whether you're male or female. And in the West, it was be dominant if you're a man and be submissive if you're a woman. But there was no relational curriculum by which people would understand how relationships work. And that's the thing I think Rian is bringing to the consciousness of the culture. And what we want to bring to the consciousness of the culture, we have a huge job to do, which is to create a curriculum that goes into all educational institutions in Western civilization so people can learn in school, from uh, preschool on through graduate school, how do human beings interact? How should they interact? What kind of interactions actually work? And you know, that's such an important point. And I want to say that fortunately, again, there's a trend in this direction. A colleague of mine actually teaches relationships at a junior college in California. And the kids, uh, I mean, the college students, but it, it really needs to be taught much earlier. Yes. And, and parenting needs to be taught much earlier. I mean, but you see, because these were supposed to be, women were supposed to be the ones who take care of relationships. Why would men who are supposed to dominate have to worry about a relationship? You know, it wasn't their problem. It was she needed to somehow accommodate. Now, there is role reversal, and women have maintained. I mean, I really want to make something very clear. Just because we have inherited a domination, uh, we have domination heritage. We've been trying to leave it behind in bits and pieces, but uh, that does not mean that uh, it is somehow men's fault. Uh, women yeah. are just as socialized to maintain domination right. systems. And we see this in the women who vote for Trump. Yeah. You know, I mean, it is, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, they, they feel safe with a bully. That's yeah. what they're used to in their family. That's, and, and it's unconscious. So that's why I place so much emphasis on childhood and why nurturing our humanity really brings out what we are learning from neuroscience. Um, and are we ready now for some questions, uh, for some comments, Sarah? Or shall we just continue talking? Let me just that? check if, if Helen and Harville wanted to respond to what they heard or? Okay. We, we agree. We're happy to hear, okay. we agree with, okay. <laughs> and happy to hear we from others. We agree with everything Rian says. She's so brilliant. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, so a first question I bring forward from Elizabeth who asks, how do we use this model in political discussions, especially with the use of social media where relationships are breaking apart? Um, there's really sort of two pieces to that, aren't there? So let me okay, let you I, respond. So I'm going to throw out a response. Uh, we talk about this going into houses, uh, at uh, your homes and houses, but what about the Houses of Congress? We uh, actually, when we're lecturing, we will say, imagine if there was a rule in um, the Senate or the House of Representatives 
that when the session was called to order, the first thing uh, the uh, Congress people would do is turn to the person next to them and give each other an appreciation. <laughs> and uh, take turns uh, mirroring back their appreciation. And then they can move ahead and debate the bill and they might vote separately, but stop and identify something about that person that uh, you think is a positive. Mm -hmm. They might, uh, their hair might remind you of their, your, your, your grandfather's hair, or your grandmother's hair, or something they're wearing, or it could be anything, a joke they told a month ago, just give an appreciation. But we have to, we have to figure out how do you structure more safety, and this way uh, our houses of Congress could collaborate. So I, I'm not exactly answering the question directly. I'm just talking about what would yeah. prevent the breakdown. So let me make a comment about it directly. You know, we've had two people come to the training program from governmental uh, agencies. One, our city uh, council in Florida, and another person, I've forgotten where they came from. But when they left, I, I think when they left, they said they were going to take it back to the council. What we've discovered is it's, it's like a family. You can't you can't go into uh, Congress and just say we're going to we're going to do dialogue. Somebody inside Congress or inside a government or inside an organization uh, who comes out who discovers this. This is what we're discovering. They come out. They discover it. They come out and get the training. Then they go back and propose a different model. And one of the models that we have for them to propose we call communal log, which is safe conversations between three or more people. So when you go to three people, you're in a group and you can go then up to about 40 people and have a group process that it becomes way more efficient than most conversations, leads to more clarity in the thinking and better proposals and better outcomes. So what we're working on is to let people know all across the world that this is will work anywhere, uh, but we don't take it into your house. We want you to come out of your house, get it, and you take it in because you already have trust. We don't have the trust. So I think that's the way we do that. We do that with a school, with a congregation, uh, with a corporation. Let me add something because the webinar that we did before this was on quantum negotiation. Wow. wow. It's very similar in the sense that people learn to empathize and to try to find a common solution. I mean, these are technologies that we are now featuring in our webinars. And the fact that these technologies like yours are springing up, as you say, I mean, relationships wasn't even, it, it was a women's thing, right? You know, we just, it isn't important. Just like families or children, you know, we, we, we can study this separately, like in home economics or something, but not in sociology, not, you know, not important. But I want to add something about the political sphere. I think that uh, it is certainly these are important ways of changing how people interact. But when you come right down to it, the bottom line is what does our system reward? And as long as our system, the normative ideal is winning mm -hmm. uh, rather than caring, uh, which of course gets us back to the gender socialization, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Uh, then we have a problem. Uh, and, and I want to mention something because we are at the Center for Partnership Studies working on laying some of the foundations systemically and we have developed new metrics, uh, economics. Uh, GDP is a lousy measure of what is valuable. It includes, uh, we're making cigarettes, the uh, medical bills that result from using them, the funeral bills, they're all great for GDP. But GDP does not include the contributions of caring for people in households, of the natural economy or the volunteer economy. So we've developed new metrics called social wealth economic indicators, and we're working on condensing and upgrading them into an index. Just one or two numbers like GDP. 
And if there's somebody out there who's interested in this, please let us know because these are the ways that we can actually intervene to change the system. What gets supported fiscally? What gets rewarded? If we can show that for our post-industrial, which social wealth economic indicators do, that caring for people starting in childhood, as I mentioned, <coughs> is essential to create this, quote, high quality human capital that we need for this you know, age of automation and robotics, etc. cetera, uh, then we can shift the thinking. And if we shift the thinking, which is how it starts, we can then shift the system of fiscal allocations. What yeah. do we support? So it goes hand in hand. The individual work is very important. At the same time, we have to also work on, as many of you out here, uh, you know, I see people from, from, our, uh, from our past webinars and people who are part of the partnership community uh, are working to change the system and not only in the United States, worldwide. Yes. I think that brings us um, beautifully to, uh, it's, it's not really framed as a question, but I think it's an important comment that I think you'll be able to sort of respond to. From Tanya um, speaking about her experience in Australia, where she says, in Australia, we are starting to teach respectful relationships in school as a means of reducing our problem with family violence. But the curriculum has been heavily criticized by conservatives who are worried about the challenge to the gender roles. Oh. So, <laughs> Rian, I thought you might <laughs> be able to reflect that back in some language that uh, of domination and partnership that might be really helpful. Well, Tanya, first of all, I'm so glad you're back and that you're doing this. It's wonderful to hear from you. And yes, of course, you're going to get the, the, look, we have not, I, I really want to use this as an opportunity to talk about something. Every single progressive social movement has challenged traditions of nominations, from the so-called divinely right of kings to rule, to the so-called divinely right of men to rule, to the so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over inferior ones, all the way to the environmental movement, right? Challenging our once hallowed conquest of nature. However, not enough attention and it takes us right back to the formative, to our past, to what we carry in our brains. Uh, not enough attention was paid to changing childhood and gender relations. So you're going to get this pushback. You're going to get these regressions as long as we don't change these areas. And the work that you're doing is so important, Tanya. Uh, and, and I, I, I just want to validate it. And um, yeah, of course you're going to get pushed back, but it's an opportunity to talk about what does it mean to be human and yeah. what men lose right. when they lose part of their humanity. And not to speak of what women lose, but really what they want to preserve is this called traditional family, uh, authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive, which is foundational to the perpetuation. It's not coincidental that it's Shia versus Sunni or Sunni versus Shia in Iran or in the Middle East, where there's a very rigid, quote, traditional male-dominated, authoritarian, highly punitive family. These are connections. And we have them in our subcultures too, in the West. So that's what I really want to urge you to change, and I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, uh, the next question um, we'll bring forward is from Rebecca, who says, I, I work with offenders who commit violent crimes against women in a court-ordered program where they don't choose to be there and may or may not want to change at that moment. How do we communicate the benefits of partnership and convince them this is a better model when they're in a dominator mentality and behavior where they so value control. And I thought, Helen and Harville, I wonder if you have worked with bringing people into a safe conversations technology who are, you know, coming perhaps not from a perspective of self 
ch of choosing to be there does that can that work um how how what's been your experience with that kind of situation uh well we had i, I don't have any experience in that particular kind of situation that's a specialized area but what we would do if we were in that situation mm -hmm. is that we found you have to bring people into interaction and and the interaction being a uh, the kind that we showed you a little bit of an example where they get they hear each other and even though they don't want to be there like when couples come one of them never wants to be there um, and usually mm -hmm. one of them got both of them there but when we put them into the dialogical um, laterality and 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 we hold them into the structure what happens is they discover that they're feeling something they've never felt before so they learn, they feel safe, then they become vulnerable, then they're open to new information. But if a person is scared, if a person is, uh, is if they're scared, they're always going to have their defenses up. You can't teach a scared person how to love. They just can't learn it. What you have to have is a scared person has to be in an environment where they feel safe enough to relax their defenses by experiencing that somebody is actually listening to them in all their anger, but they're listening to them without judging them. And at some point that makes an impact. And when the defenses drop, then you can offer an alternative behavior. But other than that, you'll simply get a pushback from any uh, suggestion that you be different. <coughs> mm -hmm. So that's what we would do, would be to set them up in a conversation so they could move from the polarization with which they will start <coughs> To empathic connecting and when they get into empathic connecting then they can take in new information and then a new idea and then begin to move toward uh, living in a different way and I want to point to a comment uh, that was made at 1227 by VER I don't know who else what but as a perpetrator in recovery who now coaches my clients to shift from abusive patterns to partnership model, I know that most perpetrators feel like victims. You yes. know what we were saying. Teaching perpetrators to empathize with themselves, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, I mean, really reparent their inner child and open to their own vulnerability helps them move towards more empathy for others. Once that innate empathy is freed, it works to preclude future perpetrations. Of course, other skill sets are needed, etc. But I think that's, uh, you know, echoes really what you were talking about. And I thank whoever VER is very much for that comment. And I love it when I look at these comments from people and see that you are contributing uh, to this. This is a joint enterprise. Yes. And, um, you know, having empathy for yourself is something that boys are not taught. And girls uh, really are supposed to suppress part of their humanity and just, you know, I mean, it's a mess. So let's really work together to change the normative ideals in the culture. Because that is what is pulling us back. The reinstatement of the old normative ideals, especially of what men and women are supposed to be like, which of course models domination and submission. Yeah. And what, if, if we get rid of that one, uh, we, we've really made a huge step forward. And it won't be easy and it won't be quick, but it is being done and it can be done. So I thank you all so much. My God, I see we're over the hour. We we are um, done with our allotted time for today, and I did want to just before we part ways, in addition to um, thanking our panelists and um, offering a, a you each a, a final word um, before we before we go, I did want to share um, one more time the information about um, the second part of the. Um, uh, oops, we're on the wrong. I'm on the wrong slide we're going to um, do the second webinar the Where? second webinar is exactly what i wanted to um speak to um and i'm gonna i'm having too much trouble bringing up that slide but it is on thursday january 16th you'll all be informed about it um in your follow-up email 
which as some of you have asked in the chat, we'll also include the chat, the trans transcript of the chat itself so you can see and follow up with people who have shared links but um helen harville could you speak just a little bit give a little bit more information for people about what to expect on the in the january um session basically you really it's hard to understand what this is if you hear about it when you turn around and experience it it's just transformational so bring somebody uh one of your um a, a parent a kid in your in your family a neighbor a, a, a you described it perfectly sarah just as someone from work or a friend and harville and i <clears throat> are going to coach you in learning the basic skills of safe conversations on the webinar so you need to have someone to do the process with okay important to important to say and Helen and Harville would you like to just have a final word of um, closing here um, in either in relationship to, to Rian or to the attendees or both uh, well uh, my first appreciation uh, given my psychology is the gratitude for anybody who showed up there's a part of my psychology is I'm going to show up and nobody will be there so I'm delighted <laughs> to hear about all the chat responses there were people actually on and listening and if I understand there were lots of people on from all Absolutely. around. Absolutely hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. So thank you for showing up and especially for this topic because I think what uh, we're working on and what Rian's working on is the axis of the shift in Western, in Western civilization especially the shift away from a culture dominated not only by of the dominator, but also by the whole concept of the individual as an autonomous, independent, and self-sufficient creature, that we're moving toward a relational civilization. And when we move toward a relational civilization, that's a, a big thing that's going to do a lot of uh, changes to that. And also, it's just an honor to be in Rian's presence. And I, I see you now on the screen to hear your voice, to hear the magnificence of your mind, your thinking, and your research. So it's an honor to be in your presence, and I feel upgraded today by being with you. So thank you oh, very thank much. Thank you so much. How very kind of you. And I want to relate what you just said to gender socialization, because part of the focus on the individual is the fact that that's what men are supposed to be, autonomous, yeah. right? And that's become the ideal norm. And of course, in reality, we are all interconnected. And the thing is that beautiful little video that you showed of the baby, what we want from birth on is caring connection. Right. That's what a partnership system, not perfect, not ideal. Right. Never, I mean, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good, I always say. And, we, and, and holding ourselves to a, an ideal of perfection is a mess. It's a dominator technique. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you so much, Helen and Harville. Could I just mention, Please. I'm wearing a, a bracelet. Gloria Steinem has been saying the last 15 years, we should be linked, not ranked. And uh, the Ms. Foundation started making bracelets with that uh, quote on it. But uh, the Relationship First website has some things that um, help you do this at home if you are interested. Um, there, uh, again, watch the videos and... Um, we are so thrilled about our emerging partnership with Rian. Yeah, relationshipsfirst.org, right. And I want to say something. In the Chalice and the Blade, I introduced the concept of linking versus ranking. Oh, oh. wonderful. I don't know that you realize that, but Gloria got it from the Chalice and the Blade. Oh, cool. Yeah, well, that's okay. You know, the main thing is that it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> I just well, wanted to say hello. <laughs> but have the profits of the bracelet at least with you. But yeah. <laughs> thank you for coming we'll up with tell that her to great be sure idea. To footnote you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you all for being with us. And I want to acknowledge Sarah and Anne behind the scenes for, as always, uh, leading us through technical difficulties and all kinds of stuff <laughs> and making this work. And of course, Helen and Harville and all of you. Bless you and thank you. Indeed. All right. Be well, everyone. Watch for your follow-up email, which will include 
the recording link um, links to Relationship First website, to the Center for Partnership Studies website, uh, to other resources that we've pulled together, um, to links also to the additional videos that Helen and Harville um, referenced in their in their discussion. Um, so, and thank you so much for the robust and um, really vibrant chat that has been going on uh, throughout. It's just a joy to see all of your minds um, percolating and, and all the sharing. And so you'll also receive that link to the transcript of the chat. Many of you have shared websites. Also, thanks to those of you who have shared uh, information about where Relationship First trainings are happening. Um, or safe conversation trainings happening all around the country. I know many of you have been connecting around that as we've spoken. Um, so um, let this just be a starting point and we'll look forward to seeing many of you again in January and uh, for the next installment. So be well, we'll close the session now. That's something uh, since we are talking about things to come, uh, we will be offering uh, not only other webinars, but online classes. So stay tuned to centerforpartnership.org for those. We're actually also doing one with the Omega Institute, which I think many of you will be very interested in. So I just wanted to add that to the uh, coming attractions. Thank you all so much for everything. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.